I'm going to pray for us as we come before God's Word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for speaking to your children. Thank you for speaking to us. You love us. You want good for us. You want better things for us sometimes than we want for ourselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That you don't give up on us. You work in us and through us for the increase of your glory and the expanse of your kingdom. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be holy and pleasing to you. You are our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray, amen. A couple years back, several actually, I was in my office with a young man who had asked for some counsel. Uh, but when I sat down with him, I realized uh, he actually didn't need any counsel. He already knew exactly what God's will was for his life. See, this young man was looking to get married, and uh, there was an attractive girl in his life, and he'd uh, prayed about her, asking for a sign, and uh, just after he prayed, he saw seven pigeons land in his driveway. And he knew that doves are God's bird, and seven is God's number, and this just filled him with this incredible sense of peace about this whole thing, which confirmed this girl was God's will for him. It was a very interesting story. Finally, after he took a breath or so, I asked him, though, well, if, if you know that this is God's will for you, what do you need from me? Well, he replied uh, after a little bit of a pause, this girl doesn't know that I like her yet, and I was thinking it might be powerful if the pastor mentioned <laughs> that I was God's will for her. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Fort George. It's awesome being a pastor. Here's some crazy stories. If you got a Bible, go ahead and open it up to Romans chapter 12. Uh, we are in a very interesting section of text this week. In the 11 chapters uh, before this, uh, they've been, uh, Paul's been unpacking how the gospel works, how, uh, how it is that God loves us and graciously offers us what we don't deserve in hope that we'll receive it and give our lives to living for his glory. And Paul now shifts his gears to begin describing what a life lived for God's glory actually looks like, practically. And he starts by unpacking the will of God. So would you stand with me as we come before God's word? I'm going to pick it up, uh, Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. We looked at verses 1 and 2 last week. We're going to look there again. We're going to go down to verse 8. So hear now the word of the Lord. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God's distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. This is the word of the Lord. You can go ahead and be seated. So last week, we really dug into the word transformed from verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And we said that this word describes organic change, not mechanical change. So it's what happens uh, to a caterpillar who's spent his life eating leaves. And then he enters this cocoon, and after a while, he emerges as a butterfly who now spends none of his time trying hard not to eat leaves. 
Instead, he spends all his time flitting from flower to flower, sucking nectar. He wants different things because his very essence has changed. And this is the kind of organic change that Jesus wants from his followers. So he doesn't want you to spend your life trying hard to be good. He wants you to be won by his love so that you want to be good. Well, today we're going to dig into the last sentence in verse 2 where we get this promise about knowing God's will. And so here's the outline. If you're taking notes, uh, I encourage this. You can take your phone out. You can send yourself an email or something like that if you want to remember this, if you're interested in like what God's will is for your life. If you know it already, don't worry. You'll be in my office and up here as an illustration, all right? But if you want to know, take some notes. Here it is. Here's the outline. We're going to look first at what God's will is then what it looks like to work this out, and finally, where the power comes from to do it. What the will of God is, what it looks like to work this out, and where the power comes from. So, first, what is God's will for your life? Paul says, don't copy, this is the NLT, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. First thing I want us to see here is that God's will for your life is less about the specific choices we make and more about a way of thinking that leads to good choices. This is really, really important because the main misunderstanding about God's will is that it has, you know, God has a specific school where you should go to or a specific job where you should work or a specific city you should live in or a specific person you should date, whatever. This is what people think of when they think of God's will. I, I got to get this right. And thinking about God's will like this actually stems from two false assumptions. The first is that if we find God's will for our life, then life is going to go good. If we find God's will for our life, then life is going to go good. So if we go to the wrong school or take the wrong job or move to the wrong city or marry the wrong spouse, then life is going to go bad. Things just are not going to work out. And we'll say things like, ah, you know, I made a mistake, right? I thought I was supposed to go to this school. And now look how everything's worked out. It's, it's terrible. Obviously, this wasn't God's will for me. Ever said that? The problem with this idea is that it isn't biblical. So think Jesus praying in the garden. Father, take this cup from me, but not what I will, your will be done. Father, I, I don't want to die, but I trust that what you want for me is, is best, even if it means I die. And guess what? The cross was the Father's will for Jesus. So it's not biblical to think that God's will for you means a health and wealth and comfort all the time. The fact is that God often leads us into painful situations because he wants better things for us than we want for ourselves. Now, this does not make bad things easy. To accept. I just want to say that, especially if, if you're in the middle of something terrible and you're suffering, this does not make bad things easy to accept in your life. But trusting the Father in the midst of the bad, like Jesus did, means accepting that somehow, somehow, at God's level, somehow God is working all things, all things out for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And we know from Hebrews that this was the case for Jesus. Because of the joy awaiting Jesus, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. So the father brought Jesus through the cross 
to the abundant life that he had for him. And he does the same for us. Are you in the midst of a hard time right now? Are you trusting that even in this, God can work all things out? Not God can. God is working all things out. God wants better things for you than you want for yourself. The question is, will you trust that he is in fact working? So the, the first assumption then is that uh, if we find God's will, everything's going to work out great. The second assumption we make about God's will is that it's something that we need to get right at all. We need to get God's will right. So uh, we all know that God knows the future, and we know that he's given us free will. This is all back from Romans chapter 9. And so then we kind of assume that if we're going to hold these things together, this must mean that God knows all the, the options that are available to us. Uh, he knows what's going to be best for us. He knows what's going to be second best. He knows what's going to be 47th best. And our job is to figure this all out. It's like God's got this target. Small little bullseye and then ever increasing larger circles where it's more and more likely that we're going to hit there as we miss the mark. This is just terrifying the more that you think about it. Like there are a hundred universities in Canada. That's a lot of rings if you're trying to find the one that God has for you. Right? And there's even more companies to work at. And I looked this up. There's 9.6 million single men living in Canada and 8.6 million single women. Imagine shooting for a bullseye among 9 million. Not to mention that its odds are better for some than others. That's a different story. <laughs> Here's the good news. If you think God's will for your life is a target that you can miss then you're doing God's will wrong. If you're thinking of it as a target that you got to hit, you got to hit that bullseye, then you're doing God's will wrong. That's not how it works. Instead, God's will for your life is less about the specific choices you make and more about a way of thinking that leads to good choices. Look at the context. Paul says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Notice that knowing God's will is butterfly level easy. Paul doesn't say, try to figure out what God's thinking. I imagine he said that, right? That'd be impossible. He says, when your way of thinking has been transformed, then you'll know what God's will is. So, back from last week, as we renew our mind, focusing again and again on the gospel, we don't get past the gospel. That's not entry-level Christianity. We're renewing our mind in this over and over again, this message that Jesus loves you in spite of all the brokenness that you bring to the table. When you actually see, not just intellectually know this, but actually see how much he loves you and allow yourself to be won by his love, then Jesus transforms your mind into one that actually wants to please him and knows his will. Let me say this another way. And I'm going to say this very, very carefully. When you've been won by Jesus' love, when you've been won by Jesus' love, then God's will for your life is that you do whatever you want. When you've been won by Jesus' love, God's will for your life is that you do whatever you want. Now, of course... What you want when you've been won by Jesus' love means not sinning, 
Of course, right? It's never God's will that you're going to lust or steal or murder or covet. But if you've been won by Jesus' love, this is what we looked at last week, you're not spending your time trying hard not to do those sins, focusing on sin. You're actually trying to please Jesus because you want to. Jesus, I I can't believe what you've done for me, right? You love me to the moon and back. You you want better things for me than I want for myself. So, of course, I want to please you. I want to please you with with everything, with my sexuality. So, of course, I trust your parameters for how sex works best because you know everything. And I want to please you with this. And I want to please you with my education and my employment. I want this to glorify you. So I'm going to study and work as hard as I possibly can in order to reach the full potential you created me to become. But I'm not going to overwork and I'm not going to overstudy because my identity comes from you, not these things. I want to honor you. With everything, everything I watch, every word that I speak, every, every thought that I think, every penny I spend, I want to please you. I want to make you smile. Not so I can earn something from you, but because you've already graciously given me everything. You've given me yourself. I just want to please you because I love you. Friends, that is abundant life. When you're doing whatever you want, when you've been won by Jesus' love, then God's will for you is that you do whatever you want. And here's the great thing. You can't get it wrong. You can't get this wrong. If you say, you know, God, I trust that you know what's best for me and and you want what's best for me and and I think I found someone who trusts you the same and loves me as well and so I'm going to marry them. You can't get this wrong because God's will is not a specific spouse. It's that you would seek to love him with any and every relationship that you have. That's God's will for you. And then, of course, uh, God's will becomes that you image him to any spouse that you choose. So his will is that you die to yourself and serve them for his glory. And, And guess what? It's hard. But as you image Jesus to whatever spouse you wanted, you find yourself in God's will. Now, we talked a lot about relationships here, but maybe you're not married. Maybe you'd like to be or... Maybe you're not really worried about this. Guess what? God's will is not that you get married or don't get married. God's will isn't about getting married. What God wants for you and from you is that you fall in love with him. That's that's when you see how much he loves you and and trust that he knows best. And as a result, you want to live every aspect of your life for his glory. That is is God's will for your life. That's God's will for you. Just one more thought on this. What do you think would happen if every decision you made came out of a deep love for Jesus and a desire to please him? What would happen to the quality of the decisions that you make? What would happen... In your relationships? What would happen at your workplace? What would happen with your health? What would happen with your free time? What would have what kind of decisions would you make if you were constantly thinking, Jesus, with everything that I do, I want to honor you? Answer? You'd make wise decisions. Notice, I didn't say you'd make the right decisions. God's will isn't about right and wrong. When you want to please Jesus, God's will for you is that you do whatever you want. There's freedom there. But there are decisions that are wiser than others. These are the ones you find yourself drawn to. Point number one. Then Paul clarifies something, and here we come to point number two. 
In verse 3 to 8, he talks about what it looks like to live out the will of God. And he gives us a bit more direction here. And it turns out that God's will for you is that you use the gifts that he's given you to serve his body. This is God's will for you. So Paul says this, don't think you're better than you really are. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of one body. And we all belong to each other. It is grace. God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. And then Paul goes on to give us seven examples. And so he says, you might be gifted to prophesy. Now this word actually means to exhort, uh, to speak words that cause people to be drawn into what God's will is for them. It's actually what's going on right now. All right. Uh, So you could have that kind of gift or you could be gifted to serve or to teach or to encourage or to give or to lead or to show mercy. But these gifts aren't for yourself. Like, wow, I got such a great gift. I'm such a gifted person. They're for the church. You see, it's not accident. It's not an accident that the gifts that Paul talks about actually follow his unpacking of God's will. These these sections of text are just totally tied together. After we've been won by Jesus' love and had our desires transformed, then we want to bless Jesus' body. Some bodies work, right? So if your tongue is healthy, then it wants to drink Chardonnay, not bleach, right? If your tongue is healthy, if your finger is healthy, it wants to touch something soft, not something hot. Uh, If your eye is healthy, it wants to look at something beautiful, not something nasty. Because this is good for the body. The other day I got home from work late, and so I was trying to eat dinner while my kids were watching National Geographic. And they were watching about dung beetles. And what my eye was taking in was not helping my stomach. The parts of our body want to do things that build up the body. Here it is. When your body is healthy, that's the way it works. And it's the same with the spiritual gifts that Jesus gives. So the parts, we're all parts here. The parts don't exist for themselves. Can I just say something? This story isn't about you. Not about you. It's not about me. We're part of Jesus' story. It's his story. If you're here, that's the story we're telling. It's not your story. It's not about you. All of us exist for the benefit of Jesus' body. So I want to give you five quick points about the spiritual gifts here. So first of all, uh, there are multiple lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament. uh, At least four of them. Uh, None of these lists are the same. So here's the point. The point is that the gifts listed aren't exhaustive. There's no limit actually to spiritual gifts. So Anything can be a spiritual gift as long as you're good at it and you can use it to build up Jesus' church. Anything can be a spiritual gift. So sound engineering and accounting and parking lot sweeping can be spiritual gifts. These are acts of service. Administration and vision casting can be spiritual gifts. These are gifts of leadership. Every ability that you use to build up Jesus' church comes from a gift. Because you're building up Jesus' church. That's what it's about. That's the first thing. Lots of gifts. Second, uh, in none of the lists is there any mention of a gift of criticism. All right? Jesus did not gift this to his church. Yet I constantly meet people who see problems in the church and feel that it's their responsibility to point these out. Friends, you are not A prophet, if you can see problems here. Pointing out problems at church is like pointing out calories at McDonald's. 
Thanks, Einstein. All right? <laughs> but the fact is, gifts like criticism come from a different father. A father who wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Alternatively, healing the brokenness in Jesus' church is a gift. So if you discern, discernment is connected perhaps to criticism. If you discern that there is a problem here, there is an exceptionally good chance that Jesus has gifted you to cure it. So don't complain about it. Give yourself to healing it. Jesus has given gifts to build up his church, not tear it down. Is that what you're doing with your abilities? Build it up. That's second. Third, just because some are gifted doesn't mean that everyone isn't required to do these things. So just because you're not the best, I don't know, teacher in the room doesn't mean that you're not required to teach the people around you what Jesus has taught you. Each Jesus follower is called to be a disciple and a disciple maker. So if you're not teaching someone then you're not actually following Jesus because Jesus was a teacher. Are you teaching somebody? Are you discipling someone? Similarly, every Jesus follower is called to encourage and serve and show mercy and lead and give in some context. And if you're a Jesus follower, everything you own, of course, is God's. It all belongs to Jesus. And so, of course, you're going to give, right? Now, some people are gifted at these things. I know people who are gifted givers, and if this is you, then you love playing a big role in building up the finance, finances of the church. But guess what? If you're not gifted this way, you still give. We all do these things. Nobody gets to say, well, you know, Jesus didn't give me the gift of mercy, so I just get to be hard-nosed and call everybody out. Not my gift, right? If that's you, you're following that different father. Everyone is called to show mercy. Some people are good at it. But just because you're not gifted doesn't mean you don't have to do these things. Fourth, everybody's got a gift. Everybody's got a gift. Verse 6, Paul says this. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. This means there should be no unemployed Jesus followers at church. No unemployed Jesus followers at church. So nobody should come to church hoping, you know, to be recharged by great music and a good talk so that you can go out and, and just live another week. If you come to church to get, you're doing church wrong. We need to come to church to be the church. Interesting. So if you're a Jesus follower... Jesus has gifted you to do a job here. If you're a Jesus follower, Jesus has gifted you to do a job here. So come to church saying to yourself, how has Jesus gifted me to build up his body today? How, how is that going to happen? Where can my gifts heal the brokenness that I see here? If you're asking those questions, that's when you're doing church right. I don't know what's squeaking. Could be the fan in the light or somebody outside. Do your best to ignore it. <laughs> You've been gifted to do a job here. Are you doing your job? Everybody's got a gift. Finally, no one's gifts make them more special than anyone else. Paul says, don't think you're better than you really are. Uh, just as our bodies have many parts, so it is with Christ's body. Uh, we're many parts of one body, and in his grace, God's given us different gifts uh, for doing certain things well. So there's simply no room in the Jesus-following community for heroes besides Jesus. Once Jesus told a story about a master who had three servants and uh, the master went away and he gave talents to each of the servants and one got five and one got two and the other got, got one. And while the master's gone, you know this story, the servants got to work, at least two of them did. Five talent guy earns five more and the two talent guy earns two more and 
The one talent guy got scared and did nothing. And when the master returned, he was equally impressed with the first two servants. Equally. And things didn't go well for the third. Now it can feel like this story isn't fair. Right? As we look at our own lives. Like why didn't the master give everybody the same? But here's the crazy part. The thing the master did the same was give. None of the servants had anything before the master gave. And none of the the servants had anything the master needed. It's not actually about the servants. None of them deserved any talents. It's all grace the whole time. And so it is with our gifts. So here's the thing. Jesus doesn't care whether you've got five talents or two. He doesn't care. What matters is that you use everything you've been graciously given. Don't hide it. Don't bury it. Use what you've got to build up Jesus' church. Use it. Last point. Where does the power come from to use your gifts to do God's will? Where does the power come from to use your gifts to do God's will? Over and over again in Scripture, we see that what matters is not what we do. God's will isn't that you do a certain thing. What matters is why we do it. This is what separates Jesus' followers from everyone else. You see, uh, there's lots of people in the world who hate Jesus and do good things, right? You met some of these people? They give to charity. They don't buy non-compostable products. They never kick their neighbor's cat, even though he deserves to be kicked just because it's a cat, right? (laughs) But the difference between good people and gift-wielding, God's will-following Jesus lovers, difference between good people and those kind of people is the motivation behind their actions, Paul starts this section saying, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. With following Jesus, the power to follow and to do his will, which is seeking the glory of God in everything we make and building up his church with everything we have, the power to follow God's will springs out of the transformation of meeting Jesus. That's where it comes from. So, I made no promises to bear the message of God's will to that girl because that's not how God's will works. Rather, God's will becomes everything you want when you continually renew yourself in the gospel, in how wise Jesus is. He's infinitely wise, knowing exactly what is best, and how loving Jesus is. He's infinitely loving, wanting the best for you. When this is your experience, then you're full of desire to please him. And you're actually motivated and you grow in motivation to trust him with everything you've got. And this is God's will for you. There's no mystery here, friends. You don't have to try to discern God's secret knowledge. The power to know and to do God's will comes when you fall in love with him because of what he did. That's when you want what he wants. You want to use your abilities and your gifts to build up his church. Are you there? Are you growing in that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are an incredible God because uh, you do know everything. You're infinite in your knowledge. You know the best ways for everything to work out. But even more than that, you want good things for us. You want the best things for us. 
And so I pray, Jesus, that even in this moment, you will win our hearts, that there would be some of us sitting here who would realize, Jesus, I can't believe that you love me that much. In spite of all the brokenness that I bring to the table, I can't believe that you love me that much. And I want to live my life for your glory. I want to use the abilities that you've given me for your glory to build your church up. I pray, Jesus, that you would do this work in our hearts, in your name, and for your glory. Amen.